On this week's edition of New York Now, the election is over and the results are in, with Democrats largely holding on to power in New York. We'll tell you what happened. Then, Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and Dave Lombardo from the Capitol Press Room join me to break down what happened and what it means moving forward. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Tuesday is now behind us, and it has been quite the election cycle. Just last summer, politics in New York looked different. Andrew Cuomo was governor, and he was running for a fourth term, and the Republicans were still settling on a nominee. But then Cuomo resigned, and his lieutenant governor, Kathy Hochul, took his place. A few months later, Republicans would rally around Congressman Lee Zeldin to challenge her. And now, after a race that felt like it just would not end, we now enter a new chapter in New York's history. Take a look. History made in New York this week. Kathy Hochul became the first woman in state history to be elected governor. That was after weeks of suspense, as polls showed the race between her and Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin tightening. But in the end, voters picked Hochul. Tonight, you made your voices heard loud and clear. And, and you made me the first woman ever elected to be the governor of the state of New York. But I'm not here to make history. I'm here to make a difference. She rallied with other Democrats Tuesday night in Manhattan as the results came in. And at the start of the night, no one really knew what was going to happen. It was the first time in more than a decade that Democrats were truly worried they could lose statewide. And that showed in the results. Hochul won, but by less than 10 points, the tightest margin seen in a race for governor in New York since 1994. She framed her victory as a rejection a political extremism. <laughs> the lessons of tonight's victory are that given the choice, New Yorkers refuse to go backwards on our long march toward progress. And we embrace the torch that's been passed to us from all those who fought the good fight years before we came here. Republicans always knew that winning statewide was a long shot. Registered Democrats outnumber Republicans here two to one. But Zeldin tried to combat that, campaigning for independents and moderate Democrats on bipartisan issues like crime and the economy. In the end, it wasn't enough. But on election night, Zeldin said he would not concede. So, so what's going to happen is that over the course of uh, these next couple of hours, you're going to see the race continue to get closer and closer and closer and closer. And it did get closer, but Hochul still came out ahead. Zeldin conceded the race privately to Hochul the next day. He said the race was competitive because of a particularly strong campaign effort targeted at voters in the middle of the political spectrum. Uh, we had support coming in from Republicans and Democrats and independence. We all united as New Yorkers because we were committed to saving our state. And you poured your, your heart and soul into this uh, entire effort. Democrats running statewide in New York for positions like governor, attorney general, controller, and U.S. Senate usually win by at least 15 points. And a lot of the time, the gap is wider. But like in the race for governor, this year was different. Attorney General Letitia James, the incumbent, won four years ago by a gap of nearly 30 points. This year, she won by less than 15 points. You see, right now, my friends, we are divided. We are polarized. And there are those on the left and those on the right, and those who have taken themselves out of the democratic process. 
because they feel disregarded and forgotten about. We're at a crossroads, my friend, in this state, and we must choose the path that takes us forward, not backwards. While extending a reach to every corner of this state, her Republican opponent, Michael Henry, did not give a concession speech on election night. And the race for state controller was also tighter than usual. Democrats have held that seat for 30 years. They first won it in the early 90s and even held it through all three terms of Republican Governor George Pataki. And that streak will continue. Incumbent controller Tom DiNapoli, a Democrat, won re-election to a fourth full term, but also by less than 15 points. Uh, my friends, I know this wasn't the easiest year for our party, but I'm very proud of how hard we worked, how we kept our message out there. As I crisscrossed the, states, the state, I saw Democrats engaged, motivated, working hard each and every day. It made me more proud than I've ever been to be a Democrat in the year of 2022. His Republican opponent, Paul Rodriguez, didn't give a concession speech Tuesday night either. And probably the most recognizable New York politician won his race as well. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a Democrat from New York, won his race, but by the closest margin since he was first elected to the Senate in 1998. And I vow to you and to all New Yorkers, I will work just as hard to make this new term every bit as impact impactful as the four that came before it, because you know why? New York is in my bones. Schumer's Republican opponent, media personality Joe Pinion, also didn't give a concession speech on election night. As for the state legislature, Democrats will remain in power there, too. No surprise in the Assembly, where Democrats have had a firm majority for decades. But in the state Senate, Democrats lost a few seats, mostly upstate and on Long Island. They'll remain in the majority there, but with fewer votes to count on. Whether that changes the dynamic in Albany will remain to be seen. Lawmakers will return for the new legislative session in January. And a lot more happened Tuesday as well with some surprises. Let's get into it with this week's panel. Karen DeWitt is from New York State Public Radio. Dave Lombardo is from the Capitol Press Room, also on public radio. Thank you both. You're welcome. So I want to start broad. This was a very interesting election cycle. As I mentioned before we came on the air, Andrew Cuomo was governor a year ago. Well, not a year ago today, but a year ago in 2021, right. early 2021. Back then, the election was a very different looking beast than it was on Tuesday. Right. But Karen, what were your takeaways from watching? Yeah, that? I thought it was going to be pretty boring when it started. That Hochul <laughs> would yeah. win. You know, it was kind of her race to lose, but it got very exciting in the final uh, week. She sort of banked on um, support of abortion rights and threats to democracy being the main issues. And then crime started creeping up, sort of thanks to the uh, support of her supporter, um, I mean, her challenger, Lee Zeldin, who was really bringing up the, the crime issues and it was really resonating. And um, she didn't really pivot all that quickly to address what were some real concerns that people had. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it got really exciting in the final weeks when Zeldin was surging. And I think Democrats were kind of panicking about that. I think so, too. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to say, I think the Republicans really did a very good job campaigning in this cycle. Mm -hmm. I think they really hit on the issues that people seem to really care about mm -hmm. in terms of crime and the economy. I don't honestly know if crime would have been that big of an issue if they didn't campaign on it. Because I don't think that people would see uh, maybe the, the spike in crime in the data as we report it and think there's a crime wave happening. Well, well, there's that cycle that kind of feeds upon itself. Yeah. When politicians are talking about an issue, it might then get more media coverage, like uh, our friends in the New York Post when it comes to every single crime that's occurred o over the last uh, two plus years. And then you get politicians who are, are talking about it. So it becomes this sort of feedback loop. And when you talk about those issues that people care about, Polling has shown repeatedly leading up to this election that crime and inflation slash the economy were what people were caring about in New York, whereas abortion was down, I think, about 6 percent in terms of the number of voters who said that was their top issue. And we saw earlier in the summer that that was something that really resonated with voters. I think 
Pat Ryan's special election victory in Congress might have been uh, on the back of uh, the abortion issue in August, but yeah. this election wasn't held in August. I right. mean, if Kathy Hochul could have done anything, maybe move this election up three months w would have really helped her with that abortion messaging. Right, if the, if the Dobbs decision had come, like, right. in September. Yeah. But I think that the, the issue with crime, there's just a general sense of unease that people have, and it's not just crime, it's the economy, it's the inflation. COVID, the pandemic, I mean, let's face it, are any of our lives the same as they were before no. the pandemic? There's just always a kind of unease about this isn't working right, this isn't quite right. You know, just a, a small example, the restaurants are always closed on Monday and Tuesday, like just a lot of aggravations. And I think the unease about, you know, certainly there is a rise in violent crime really resonated with people. And I think the Democrats could have addressed that better. And they didn't. And they were, they were certainly Kathy Hochul was slow to realize mm -hmm. because she thought reasonably it's not all about bail reform. It's much more complicated than right. that. But, but I also think she didn't want to talk about it because I think yeah. the Democratic position on criminal justice issues is complicated. It takes a nuanced conversation yeah. to explain. She never wins, right? right. <laughs> and they never had a good talking point on any of this stuff. And so that's why I think we saw that they weren't willing to engage until they really had to in, in October. And like you said, that's not enough time to really hammer your message home to these swing flippity floppity voters. Yeah, I think she was also worried about the progressive wing of her party too. She mm -hmm. didn't want to offend them and have those people stay home because right. then she really wouldn't get elected, so. You know, it also helps that Republicans have been, uh, you know, nailing this messaging around bail reform specifically mm -hmm. since 2020. It, Democrats passed it initially in 2019. It took effect in 2020. And since then, Republicans have been out in front on that issue, trying to convince the public that it is the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, over the past few years, we've seen crime go up. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this really kind of like um, perfect storm for them in terms of, of things that have happened in the past two years, whereas the data doesn't reflect that bail reform has had anything to do with crime. Uh, reporting from Yancey Roy and Newsday show that the re-arrest rate in 2019 is about the same as it was in 2021. Right. So it's that kind of interesting, I, I think yeah. they played like a very smart long game. And I think there might have been some similarities, and Karen, maybe you can help me out, um, between this election and the 1994 race mm. with George Pataki and Mario Cuomo. Did you see any similarities? Well, the, the fear of crime. Yeah. In fact, it was about uh, the death penalty. Right. I used to call it the race about death and taxes because Pataki <laughs> wanted to <laughs> cut taxes and um, re, you know reinstate the death penalty, which Mario Cuomo was just against. And he knew that that was unpopular in those days, but he just stuck with that because he had this kind of moral backbone that doesn't always help you when we're winning elections, unfortunately. And um, yeah, so the, cri the fear of crime is very similar to 1994. Well, and this Go shouldn't ahead. have been a surprise to Democrats because right. we had a warning of what was coming in 2021 on Long Island with the races in Nassau County where Todd Kaminsky, a popular Democratic state senator, lost a race for district attorney and even dragged down a popular Democratic county executive. And so then, fast forward to this election night, Democrats went from five seats on the state, in the state Senate on Long Island to now they're probably only going to have two out of nine seats. So the writing was on the wall. And the fact, again, that they didn't respond to it, at least across the state until October, shows a real failure by uh, Kathy Hochul, as well as the Democratic Party writ large, which this whole election didn't have a coherent, concise campaign messaging. And it trickled down to you know, the actual outreach they were doing. Mm -hmm. They had palm cards that didn't even match up with some of the candidates who are running in local legislative races. So they're handing out, here's my uh, name recognition thing and here's my statewide ballot. So there could have been a, a lot more coordination and a lot more uh, organization. They also didn't have lawn signs, yeah. which in this day and age yeah. seems crazy, like who needs a lawn size, but, sign? But like I drive a lot in upstate New York. It was amazing how many Zelton signs I saw and almost no Hulkle signs ever. And I think like that's just a little detail mm -hmm. that you do need to reinforce. It's probably not enough to spend millions of dollars on TV campaign ads and social media. I feel like you still need like the on the ground stuff and they didn't really have that. Yeah, if you can't get right what people can actually see, it makes you wonder, what are they getting wrong behind the scenes? And, and I think part of that is that outreach to traditional Democratic voters. So we're thinking about black and brown people, especially mm -hmm. in New York City. And as a result, we saw the Bronx with extremely low turnout this year. And this is an area where Kathy Hochul should do very well. And she did do very well, but 
she could have driven out even more votes. And we could have seen that in, in Brooklyn as well. But I think turnout was only uh, about 33 percent, and she got 70 percent of the vote. So if she gets that turnout up to, say, 50 percent, like it was on Long Island, a strong bed for Lee Zeldin, her margin goes up and up and up. But they didn't do any of that. Yeah, I think that does show to the weakness of the party. But maybe yeah. not to Governor Hochul, because don't forget, she's only been in a year. She had to, like, figure out the entire state government, because Andrew Cuomo kept her out of everything. Mm -hmm. So she had to yeah. sort of hit the ground running, run the state, raise all this money, and run for re-election. So she's probably not going to be able to do everything well. But I think what you're saying, Dave, brings out that the party, uh, Jay Jacobs, could have been more helpful in all of those kind of things, because they certainly, uh, you know, supposedly have had those skills, right, for decades and have been in the business for decades. And it does seem like they dropped the ball in a lot of those areas. And what you say, though, about Kathy Hochul and her relationship with Jay Jacobs is true in the sense that she's only been on the job for about 15 months at this point. But now that she has settled down and won an election on her own right, it's going to be interesting to see, will she let Jay Jacobs remain as the party chair? Because while he is nominally... She says she yeah, will. Yeah, but nominally, she, he is a representative of all these committee right. members. In reality, she's the de facto head. Mm -hmm. And like Dan said, she's sort of given him a voice of support at, at this point. Right. Is she going to feel more pressure from the left to move him out? Really remains to be seen. If I'm her, I think I'm happy. I won my election, so why do, what problems do I have with Jay Jacobs? But there could be some backlash. Yeah, she couldn't really get rid of him after winning the election, and she did. She was speaking in Puerto Rico at this mm -hmm. week where the Democrats always go for the Selmos conference and to kind of de-stress after the done. elections. What are we doing I know. To I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think after this, we all go to Puerto it's because, Rico. It's because we work for public broadcasting. Yes. <laughs> That's why. You know, you, know you, you do have to wonder what the state party was doing this election cycle. I, I mean, what we saw in 2021, for example, with them not really doing a lot for the ballot proposals. Yes. You saw the redistricting proposal yes. fail. So this year, I, I would have thought they would have kind of learned their lesson there. But still with the Bond Act, I didn't get any kind of mail on the Bond Act. I didn't get any information kind of served to me as a voter on the Bond Act until the day of the election, yeah. which I found extraordinary. I got another mailer from the state party in Neil Breslin's district, because that's where I live. And the mailer was uh, about the race, but the mailer didn't say anything about Neil Breslin. It only said negative things about Rich Amador and named him by name. And as people who run campaigns know, if you're just putting your opponent out there. As a voter, I'm just looking at this piece of mail and I see a name. Yeah, you might not have even heard, if you were an average yeah. voter, you might not have even heard of Amador except yeah. for his lawn signs. So, exactly. So maybe not mention his name. Right, it, it's just fascinating to me. And I, I'm wondering if there will be a real genuine challenge for Jay Jacobs' power, because I think it was either earlier this year or late last year after the 2021 elections where Democrats did have major losses here, that there was a kind of like timid challenge to his power. Mm -hmm. And we don't really see that. I, I wonder if maybe a new makeup of the state Senate changes that. I don't know. Dave, what do you think? Maybe so. I, I think that Jay Jacobs is going to serve as long as Kathy Hochul wants him in that job. Yep. I, I think that it doesn't matter if AOC wants him out. It doesn't matter if former Democratic State Senator Alessandra Biagi wants him out. It doesn't matter if current Democratic State Senators want him out. Unless Kathy Hochul feels enough fire uh, to oust him, then she's not going to do it. And that fire is going to have to be op-eds in uh, the Buffalo News, the Times Union, persistent coverage from the New York Times. This might all blow over a month from now. I mean, we already the Democratic Party already forgot the lessons of 2021 heading <laughs> to 2022. So there's a short memory here. So let's see if we're talking about this in a month. And if we are, maybe then Kathy Hochul will want Jay Jacobs gone. No, I think you're right. I think it's like whoever the governor is comfortable with, mm -hmm. that's who's going to be yeah. the party chair. Yeah. So that's, you know, when it comes down to it. If she's comfortable with him, she's going to try to get the other people in line. Although you're right, she does have some arguments to make there about, well, why did we lose the congressional seats? Mm -hmm. Why right. is the state Senate no longer have a super majority? So there's certainly things that, you know, whether it's her fault or not, she's going to have to answer for. She's she's the boss now. I mean, you know, because she got elected to this job before you could say, well, she's filling in. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. But yeah, right. It's on her. It's, you know, it'll be fa the thing about the, the parties in general. And I think that I hope that both of you would agree with this is that 
it seems like the state Republican Party has a much more organized infrastructure to it. You have a very active chair who is now elected to Congress, won't mm -hmm. be the chair anymore. Right. They need a new chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they need a new chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a spokesperson for that party, a full-time spokesperson for that party. They're just traveling the state all the time doing right. events. Whereas the Democratic Party, you see the leadership, you re really don't see Jay Jacobs out and about all that often. I, that might be for the best sometimes. Well, yeah. I've never seen him in Albany in person. Right. I'm sure he's right. been there. He's to, kind of elusive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you don't really see this like, the public face of the party then is Kathy Hochul. Right. And as we're looking at these races for Congress and state Senate, I don't know if that's a good thing, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the co congressional races are pretty complicated. I yeah. think it had a lot to do with redistricting and the Democrats dropping the ball, overreaching on drawing maps that were very favorable to the Democrats, and then get, having it only to see it all get thrown out by the state's high court, and then having a special master. And the races were competitive. Even some of them seemed like they were almost leaning Republican. So that was like a real debacle right there. And because other Democratic con and other congressional races in other states did well. New York was the one that did poorly, which is really surprising. And Sean Patrick Maloney, the Democratic C Congressional Campaign Committee chair, being thrown out. and By a first-term yeah, assembly. Yeah, and then. he's pretty bitter about it. And, um, you know, the races on Long Island may be more expected, but just that really shouldn't have happened, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, with the lines that the Democrats in the legislature had drawn up for Congress, they were looking at potentially having uh, 21 or 22 of 26 seats. Instead, they're looking at about 15 of 26 seats. But even with the maps that they were running on right now, these were congressional lines, these sort of marginal purple areas that Democrats, at least in presidential election years, are in pretty good shape to win. We think about the districts on Long Island that flip from blue to red, the ones mm -hmm. in the Hudson Valley that have gone from blue to red. These are areas Areas that Joe Biden won. So in, in 2024, it'll be interesting to see uh, how they go this time around. Um, I, I also think that when we talk about Kathy Hochul and her down ballot uh, effect, I think we also need to think about the overall national mood. But we mm -hmm. did see congressional Democrats and candidates for state Senate and Assembly outperform Kathy Hochul uh, on the top of the ticket. So for instance, Senator Elijah Reichland Melnick, a Democrat in Hudson Valley, I think he beat uh, Kathy Hochul in his Rockland County district by about five points. But that wasn't enough to mm -hmm. overcome mm -hmm. the Republican advantage, and he's not going to be with us in January. So, right. yeah, there was definitely some candidates down ballot who were outperforming the top of the well, ticket. Also, Zeldin brought out a lot of re Republican supporters in the suburbs. Not yeah. enough for him to win, right. but enough, I think, to swing a lot of these uh, the races that did end up being flipped. He was a very, very good campaigner. And I will be frank, and I apologize to the congressman if he's watching, I did not think he was going to be. When <laughs> Nobody he, did. Yeah, in 2021, in, in uh, April, when they right. were first considering him, I really thought, I he's not that well known, you know, I don't really know where he is on top issues, things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he is going to get the name recognition needed, mm -hmm. but now and we didn't see have any money either. Yeah, and, and I think that's boy, why the, they had money by the end. Yeah, because of the, the super PACs. I think that's back, back to Dave's point. I think that's why the Democrats weren't that worried at mm -hmm. first in 2021. They're like, oh, it's just going to be like the last couple elections. Yeah. But I think for the Republicans going forward, they have to think about separating themselves from former President Donald Trump. Yes. Because I think if Zeldin wasn't so tied to Trump and hadn't voted against certifying the 2020 presidential election and also had been pro-choice, mm -hmm. I think that he could have won this race. But I think those are some items that they just, they have they have to lose Trump if they want to win statewide in New York. It's just, you know, it's not, that that's really, I think, in the end, why Democratic voters went over to yeah. Hochul, the ones that were maybe on the fence. Right, exactly. We talked about the 1994 election briefly earlier. Mm -hmm. Lee Zeldin wasn't really a George Pataki no. in that no. sense. No, right. Whereas George Pataki is now aligned with former President Trump, but we can't forget that he was in a presidential primary against President Trump in 2016. So he hasn't always been there, whereas right. Zeldin has always been on the Trump train, as people like to call it. Repu yeah. yeah, Republicans it blew their best chance to win the executive mansion by putting up a fringe candidate. You could have had a so-called moderate Republican who's pro-choice, like Karen mm -hmm. said, but also hammering home the crime issue. But yeah. Lee Zeldin is 
in both his rhetoric and his politics, a fringe Republican candidate. And Although had, he did try to downplay that, and I think in some ways he did, maybe did move beyond that. Yeah, but there was and, no messaging on education other than charter schools and critical race theory. Yeah. There was no right. talk about child care from his campaign. There were none Ooh. of that softer edges that a Republican needs to show in, in New York, in a deep, deep, deep blue state, if they want to get uh, elected. We saw now the ceiling for a fringe candidate in a great year for Republicans. And, yeah, and it point. seemed like Zeldin was going for the issues that was not, they were not going to attract the middle of the road and the Democrats. You know, when you talk about crime and the way that he talks about it, I don't know if you're getting those swing voters. We have about 30 seconds left, Karen. Um, okay, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Maybe I've said everything well, at this I, point. I'll I don't just know. Go ahead. I'm going to give a plug for the poll, pollsters, okay. which did a pretty good job in actually calling this election. They had Kathy Hochul in about a 52 to 54 percent range, and, and that's where she looks like she's going to land the plane. Yeah. So really happy to give a thumbs up to the institutional pollsters who have been taking a lot of crap yeah. for the last okay. six years. All right, if I have two seconds, I'm going to say yeah, one thing. Seconds. Here was somebody who wasn't mentioned, but I think was hovering over a lot of it, former Governor Andrew Cuomo. Yes, and actually whole segment on that another time yes, because you're so right. After Puerto Rico. <laughs> exactly. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, Dave Lombardo from the Capitol Fresh Room. Thank you both so much. And a lot more happened Tuesday as well. Uh, you can get all of it on our website at nynow.org anytime. Till then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.